Welcome, 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 everyone. Welcome back to a very special episode of Hard Reset, a Cold North production. I'm your host, Patrick, the Law Morris. Uh, joining me this week, we have a very special guest with us, author of the 2014 book, Console Wars, and actually director of the new documentary, Console Wars, now available, uh, ex- I think it's exclusively on CBS All Access. Is that right? The new- that is correct. It is available only and exclusively on CBS All Access. <laughs> exclusively on CBS All Access, Blake Harris. Blake, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks. It's good to finally meet you. Uh, we had talked a bit over Reddit over the past uh, little while, and uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for bringing me to the north. Uh, I didn't get there. <laughs> it's it's uh, north. It's cold. Get used to it. <laughs> I was going to say, I try not to leave my apartment ever. Not, not specific to that area, but... Uh, that's great. Yeah, I know. I, I, I have a, one of my best friends is from there. Heard good things. Oh, have nice. Have you lived there in a while? Um, so, no. So we, we moved here like three months ago, but I was in Maine for like four years. And uh, that's also very north and very cold. <laughs> so cool. it just, that's that's where the name came from. Um, but Blake, it, now, it, if it's okay, I, like, I just want to jump straight into things. Um, I, I do want to discuss the book. Because that's really what like that's really what hooked me on on all of your work, um, and and I just there's so much I want to know about the book and the movie, but but I do want to get started with the book. Uh, so I, I initially read the book about a year ago. Um, it was recommended to to me by a friend of mine, um, but for you it was it was obviously like a very different uh, a different experience because you were writing it. I I was just reading it. Um, so. How how did you get the ball rolling on that project? Like how did how did you like where where was your jumping off point with that? Well, it's funny you frame it that way because originally I just wanted to read a book like Console Wars or they basically like a behind the scenes story of Sega and Nintendo. And so what happened for me was this was back in maybe 2010. Um, I, I, I had my birthday. Um, my brother, who I always used to play these video games with and it's like that was like the one thing we did together when we were younger because i was a terrible older brother but like he asked me what i wanted for my birthday i said oh i don't like getting gifts and he said no i want to get you something i had a job for the first time in my life he was just out of college and he said what's the greatest gift you ever got and i said you know i I guess it was like probably like the nintendo we got or the sega we got (laughs) and so he got me a sega genesis um back in 2010 and I bought some games on eBay. I got NHL 94, my favorite game. And, like, before, I hadn't played it in, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And I kind of thought it would be, like, oh, you know, like, fun. But, like, a little, like, you know, like, oh, I've, I've graduated from this. But I was just, like, captivated by how it reminded me how fun it used to be to play those 16-bit games. And then I went to a Barnes & Noble on 86th Street in Manhattan where I lived. And I, as I mentioned, like I was just looking for the, for a book like this, I was looking for a video game history section, figuring it would be near the film history section, the music history section, especially since the game industry is bigger than both of those industries. And uh, I was shocked that, yeah, combined. And not only did not a section like that not exist, but when I asked the woman at the information desk, like, Oh, like, where's that section? Or like, do you have any books even just on this topic? She like basically laughed at me and said that in the entire store, this two-story gigantic Barnes and Noble. The only video game-related thing they had was, were walkthrough guides, oh and so God. I can't say I knew very much about video game history or the business behind it at that point. But I knew that, that was kind of ridiculous. That like <laughs> the industry that made so much money, that made so many great and wonderful and joy-bringing experiences. That like there wasn't really any behind-the-scenes stories. And I should caveat that by saying that there are, there were some books. And there definitely are some books, some great ones, like David Jeff's Game Over, Stephen Kent's Ultimate History of Video Games, and, and other ones that were just a little harder to find. But the fact that, like, you know, there was not a, a single available book in a mainstream bookstore, which um, was, was was what initially got me into wanting to write it. And then also, I think that that also informed my style of writing it in that, like, I wanted to write a book that anybody could find that would be available in a Barnes & Noble and would, you know, sort of be a gateway drug to get people into reading about the games industry. Oh yeah, a- absolutely. So it, it's funny you you mentioned NHL '94. Um, it was so I like after I read the book the first time, um, 
I, I started noticing your book everywhere in all this content that I like consume. Right. And so like, um, there's this, there's this YouTuber I watch Austin Evans and in his secondary channel on the set, like on the shelf in the background, it's just a part of the set is a copy of your book. And, uh, and I was, I was kind of looking back through, um, just looking for immediately after I finished your book, I was, I was looking for like, is he writing a sequel? Um, and, and I was, I found, your uh, your appearance on IGN's Game Scoop podcast, and and you mentioned NHL '94 to them, and it's funny because <laughs> like you, on that podcast you you talked about just the pure superiority of um of the the Genesis version of NHL '94, right. and like to me I because I was always a Nintendo kid growing up, and I just like I had never played the Genesis version, but I'll tell you I. <laughs> I've played the the Super Nintendo version, and my opinion of that game was uh, was not. I, I don't hold that game in as high regard, and I think it's probably because we played very different versions of that game. Yeah, and like by the way, I know I'm biased because I had a Sega growing up, and so I had the Sega version. But like when I started speaking with people from EA for doing interviews for the book, and told them sort of the story I just told you, the first thing they always asked was, "Oh, did you play the Genesis version?" So. <laughs> I guess it's still is subjective, but it's their subjectivity, not Blake Harris. It's, it's them that like the Genesis version is way better. The guys who actually designed it. Well, and and that's the thing is like I have talked to other friends of mine that like collect video games and and they like actively seek out you know the I, I have a couple of friends who collect sports games and like they actively seek out the the Genesis versions of basically all sports games and and that's something that like you you touched on in the book was like the just the pure dominance that that partnership with EA brought to the to the uh, right. sports simulation genre for them. Yep. Um, so so throughout the make uh, like making the book, like you must have worked. Obviously, you worked really closely with a bunch of really like old Sega people, uh, Shinobu Toyota, um, and and like Tom Kalinske. So like Tom Kalinske in particular, because he was kind of the head honcho. How did you? How did you get hooked up with him? Like, how did you? Because you, so you went, you went to the store. You decided, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create this section. How, how do you yeah, go about yeah, getting yeah, hooked up with Tom Kalinsky? Like at that point, like, uh, you know, in the movie version of this, I would be leaving the bookstore, going like, aha, I'm gonna write that book. But at that point, I was just like, I left the store, thinking like, well, that's kind of weird, and that and it made me think like, oh, I guess like the industry is really boring or like something or <laughs> like why. And then, especially because I went online and then I searched for, um, you know, just like I was trying to read about Sega versus Nintendo. And other than an article at IGN by a guy named Travis Foz, um, that was like the only thing that really covered it. Um, I'm not sure if Sam Pettis' book was out yet, but like uh, there just was so little out there. And I, uh, by the time I started, uh, I'd be, you know, also some backstory. Uh, the context of the time was I had a day job trading commodities for Brazilian clients. Like my day job was trading, buying and selling sugar futures and soybean futures and coffee futures. So like I was not a professional writer. I was not a full-time writer. And so, um, you know, if anything, I was a struggling screenwriter. Um, that was the main, that was what I did in my off hours. So you know, the idea of the book took some progression and what really pushed it into gear was I just started reaching out to people who had been at Sega and Nintendo during that time period and asking if they would talk to me about their experiences for a potential book, maybe a screenplay, maybe a documentary. And at first, you know, it was a very small percentage of people who responded, which I understood. Like I had no bylines and anything to offer them. And then that snowball started to grow. And when I got to the point that I felt like I could at least ably speak about, like, like I could ask questions I knew enough. Um, I, w I actually asked that writer of the IGN article, Travis, if he could introduce me to Tom Kalinske, and he was kind enough to do so. And so I had so I had my first interview with Tom, <laughs> I guess in like 2010. So I've known him for over 10 years now, and uh, and I remember being very uh, very nervous beforehand because one, I'd never really like interviewed a important person before, and what gave me the confidence was that I would listen to podcasts by, you know, Bill Simmons and Matthew Berry um, on the Fantasy Focus, and, like, I was like, oh, I'll kind of just do like that, like, more conversational thing, um, and I was really worried about how to record it, 
which I ended up not doing because all the recording software, <laughs> or it, it probably was using software at the time. Like it was all like stuff in spy shops, and I was like, oh, I don't want to get into like some sort of like, legal issue. Um, but but it, but like really, what made the book happen, like the biggest push, was talking to Tom that day. He gave me two hours of his time to me, like a nobody with no credits other than a few recommendations from people he had worked with many years ago. And then, and especially because the first hour of that call, we didn't even talk about Sega. We just talked about his background, which you get a sense of throughout the book and specifically in like the third or fourth chapter about his background. And I was just blown away by the fact that before we even got to the Sega stuff, I was like, oh my God, this is the man most responsible for my childhood other than my parents. Like yeah. from Flintstones, yeah. Chival, vitamins to like He-Man to Barbie to uh, Matchbox cars. Like Tom had just been there like Forrest Gump, like every step of the way. And then we got to say again, I was like, oh my God, like you're such like everyone should know about you. Yeah. Um and 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 he's like, you know, and we were talking before the show uh, about the possibility of a sequel and my saying that I, you know, I'm sure that there are great stories there. I just don't know them because my way into the book, my interest was always the characters. And so talking to Tom that day, I it was the first time in my life that I had at that point had ever left like a convert like left a meeting or left something thinking like, I am going to do this. Like I like I was so committed to the idea especially after tom told me how he got the job starting off at a beach in hawaii like very picturesque <laughs> like i knew i was going to write a book at that point it was just a matter of like would anyone ever want to read it or how long would it be or what kind of a book but like but after talking to tom that really set things into motion because i knew that there was this great protagonist with this incredible story who not only did i find entertaining but like i actually felt like people should know his story like he's an important person and I want to help, you know, amplify the message, the gospel of Tom Kalinske. And so from there, things got a lot easier was reaching out to people because then I sort of had Tom's, you know, recommendation or his blessing or, um, you know, it was, it was all an evolving conversation. But having Tom's support um, was, was pivotal. And I, again, I can't say enough about him just as a as a guy and also as a guy willing to take a chance on me who didn't really have any credits to speak of and basing it purely on my conversation with him and some materials I later sent him about my vision for the book. So yeah, it really changed my life. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like you mentioned, because he, he, you said, you know, this is the guy that's most responsible for, for my childhood besides my parents. Yeah. And, and that's like, that's kind of uh, like the thinking that I had reading the book the first time is like, like you said, Flintstones vitamins, Barbie, He-Man, and then like friggin' Sega. Like this yeah. Tom Kalinsky, the king of toys, right? <laughs> so Exactly. And like part of it was and and like that was what so what I enjoyed so much about the book and why I think the you know the movie, the documentary resonates with so many people is like there's a lot of us who grew up in the seventies, eighties, or nineties who have a connection to Tom or these products just by virtue of our age. Maybe there's nostalgia involved, but it's also just a great business and human story so you know I, I i i like i was just so grateful and i still am so grateful i can't believe that there was not several books about sega and nintendo when i went to barnes and noble that day like i still can't believe that i got to be the person to write this this story about tom and, and this incredible team and like i said it obviously did change my life you know i got to quit my brazil trading <laughs> job and do this full time um and, it, and it's been great yeah I no, a absolutely. And and so like like throughout the book, I think by virtue of the lens like that you were presenting the story through, um it, it definitely appears as though like Sega was kind of this scrappy underdog and and they were they were kind of after like Nintendo was just this monolith in in the industry, right? Um yeah. did did you have like in writing the book, did you have any reservations about the way you were presenting certain people and uh, I mean, particularly Peter Main. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, of course. I mean, you think about those things all the time. Um, I would feel like irresponsible if I didn't think about them. And I would also feel irresponsible if I didn't spend three years researching and the book. And, you know, like, like um, that's one of the things that I'm really happy about the documentary being out just for selfish reasons. So that it's, you know, just a reminder. That it's like not Blake Harris's opinion again i don't usually speak in the third person but like it wasn't my opinion of these right. things it was like i was conveying what the people thought like a, a small example that i always think of is uh like when when the sega the scrappy sega team got this the early 
the version of Nintendo Super Mario Con, they played Super Mario World, and I've had people say to me like, "I can't believe you said Super Mario World sucks," or like, for, you know, because the book has the Sega people being underwhelmed. Which, by the way, they didn't say it sucked. They thought it was good. It was just underwhelming. But it was like not me saying, "Oh, this game stinks." I like, uh, uh, but yeah, um, I, I was really. Uh, conscious of and worried about how I was portraying people. I was also maybe worried about like a potential lawsuit. It was my first ever book. Um, but like I, I also worked with the stories that I was given. Uh, initially, if when I first started working on the book, I you know not really thinking about it. I probably would have like like I was thinking, okay, every other chapter will toggle between Sega and Nintendo. Like one Sega, one Nintendo, one Sega, one Nintendo, and we'll see the different viewpoints. But because of the fact that getting access to Nintendo people was hard. And then largely, I think it worked out well because in the end, the thing was with the Nintendo people and not to take anything away from them because what they did was incredible, especially what they did five years earlier with resurrecting the game market in the United States. But like they did not do as much as the Sega people did. Like they were very scrappy and nimble and doing a lot of things. And so like every chapter, Sega people were scrambling and doing things. And the Nintendo people were much more deliberate in their approach. They had to get much more approvals from Japan. So the story to me really was much more of the Sega story. And I guess by the end, I didn't really feel, I feel really good about how it was presented. The way I've described it before is that when I was writing chapters from the Sega perspective or from Tom's perspective or Al Nielsen, Alan Beth Van Busker, Shinobu, I channeled how they felt. So I hated Nintendo. And when I wrote things from the <laughs> Nintendo perspective, I really hated Sega. Um, and I think that's me just doing my job. Yeah. And no, that, and that definitely comes across in the writing. Like I, it, it's it's interesting to hear you say that because like so I mean to let a, a little bit of personal bias in I, I I have always thought Super Mario World is a little bit of an underwhelming game I've never even finished it it's <laughs> it's just never grabbed me even as a kid it was like I was a, on the Super Nintendo I was all about Donkey Kong I thought Donkey Kong Country yeah. Donkey Kong Country yeah. too uh, but but like it's it, it's really interesting to like to hear that you were initially planning to toggle back and forth, but you know, the access, it sounds like the access to Nintendo was similar then, you know, 10 years ago as it, as it is now, because Nintendo really doesn't give those interviews. Um, but yeah, I will say, I mean, look, it was hard. The, and, and given that I had a day job trading commodities and was looking to write full time and really hoping to like make it, I was very impatient and I always wanted things to go faster, but in the end things went slowly as they usually do. And it took three years. And that was a good thing because by the end of my writing of the book, I was able to get the access to the main people at Nintendo that I wanted everybody except for Minoru Arakawa, who was the president of Nintendo of America. But like I was able to talk to Howard Lincoln multiple times and Howard Phillips and Gail Tilden and Peter Main, like you mentioned, Randy Pertzman, Tony Harmon, all these people. So it worked out nice in the end. Like basically I, I can't, you know, I do believe that even if I had had all these ingredients from the top, I probably would have structured it the way that I did, but it was sort of a nice uh, fortuitous circumstance that, that worked out that it sort of helped me structure the story more towards a Sega heavy skew in the, especially in the first half of the book. Yeah. And, and so like speaking of structure, um, uh, you, so you write the book as a narrative nonfiction, right? And yeah. was there like, was there a, a specific catalyst that really pushed you to write the book in that way? Um, it, or was it something that just sort of took shape as you collected the information? Uh, that's a good question. I guess I would say maybe this isn't the best example, but I'm a huge fan of Ben Mesrick books. Okay. Um, like when Ben said nice things about console wars, it was like a gigantic deal <laughs> for me. And, and <clears throat> I know in my opinion, he's one of the best working nonfiction narrative, nonfiction writers. So I'm sure that that played a key role in inspiring me. I'm sure that, my background as a failed screenwriter, like probably shaped my opinion in some way, though it wasn't as if I, I wasn't thinking about like adapting this to a TV screen or a movie as I was writing it. Um, but I, again, it's like the big, the big thing for me was always what's the most mainstream version of this book so that someone in a Barnes and Noble, like it'll be stocked in a Barnes and Noble, so that someone will read it. Like, so I always ask myself with that, with console wars and anything I write, like how could I get my grandma to care about the story? And I think that the way to do that is to, you know, put it through the POV of Tom Kalinske, a family man on a beach in Hawaii, to start it off, as opposed to saying, you know, in 1990, right. like four weeks into the year, right. a history textbook. 
<laughs> exactly. Um, and that's, a, you know, the biggest challenge for me was ultimately how to do both. And I think my biggest inspiration for that was the Game of Thrones book series because they essentially every chapter is a different POV and it's always scenes or it's almost always scenes. And then the history is weaved in between the scene. And that's what I wanted this book to be. I want it to be like a history textbook, like hidden inside of a, a page turner. Okay. That's yeah. so that's, it's, that's very, it's a very interesting approach and you nailed it because you, d you don't want to write a history textbook, but like you right. wrote, you wrote a story and, and it just happens to be a true story. <laughs> Right. Like if it was, yeah, it was a true story. And like, you know, if it wasn't a history book, I wouldn't have, when talking about Sony entering the game market, I would if this was just a fictional story, I wouldn't need to go into like a three or four page tangent about, so uh, about Betamax versus VHS to show like the, how that impacted Sony, but because it was history, because I had reality to pull from and because that actually informed their decisions at, with the, with their game division, like that was really fun. Like I liked sort of taking those side steps into that and like the Seattle Mariners purchased by Nintendo and things that I thought were interesting, but also were very relevant to the narrative, even if they were not like, you know, happening in that moment, but they really gave you this important context to understand everyone's motives and, and why things played out the way they did. Man, that's, that's just, it's extremely interesting. Um, so I, I do, I, I could talk to you about the book all day, but I do want to talk about the movie as well. Um, so, so your, the book was released in May of 2014. Um, yep. it's, it's been more than six years. Uh, and, and the movie just premiered on C exclusively on CBS all access last month. Uh, so, so you said that you said that you didn't always envision, like you, you didn't envision, you know, a, a, a movie or a series. Um, when did gears start uh, moving on I, the movie? Yeah, I guess I should clarify. I, I always hoped. Uh, like, because I even said my first call with Tom, and when I first started pursuing this, I didn't know if it was a screenplay, a book, or a documentary, or whatever. I guess I wasn't even thinking documentary. That was that idea was from my co-director Jonah Tulis. So I definitely want to make sure to mention Jonah, give him all the credit for coming up with the idea, and you know he he's my co-director in the documentary. Um, it like couldn't speak highly enough of the guy but uh you know from that stage we were him and joan and i were struggling screenwriters it was obviously not my full-time job I, it was my you know after hours moonlighting like lottery ticket thing that i wanted to do and uh and 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 jonah and i were, were talking about this after i'd been researching it and i thought i mean you know, we thought that maybe this is like a social network sort of movie here um which had, social network had come out at the time and and that so I guess from the get-go, or pretty close to the get-go, I always envisioned it as a movie. I just meant that I wasn't writing it as, like, um, like to, to be adapted for a screenplay. Um, yeah. Like, I was just, you know, I, I've, even with, like, with the documentary and with the book and with the TV series, I always try to start each one in whatever capacity I'm involved with, like, from scratch. Like, I'm not trying to bring one story to the other. It's like, what's the best story for this, this medium? And... Uh, and so after I had done a couple, uh, I think at that point I did like a hundred interviews um, with Tom and Shinobu and Al and Peter Main and all these people. And then um, I saw a lot of myself in Sega, just in the fact that they were an unknown company and I was an unknown writer <laughs> trying to make it uh, with hustle and grit and enthusiasm. And, you know, one of the things that I learned from Sega or one of the things that they did well that I was trying to take from was they aligned with, uh, you know, up and coming companies whether it was like viacom nickelodeon mtv or with uh, the teenage stars like joey lawrence and jenna van oy and dustin diamond and so i googled celebrity gamers and wanted to see maybe who would be interested in adapting this or producing an adaptation of the story and seth rogan came up as someone who was really into nintendo and then like somehow i don't even understand how it's possible seth is like the same age as me um, like he's only 38, which is incredible to think of what he's accomplished in such a short time because he was like directing stuff in his 20s, uh, early 20s. But uh, I asked my manager for screenwriting because, as I said, I was a screenwriter but a not successful one. I did have good representation, and uh, my manager Julian sent over a treatment to Seth and Evan's company, Seth and Evan Goldberg, um, and like they were interested and wanted to meet, and that was that was 
that was the most life-changing moment of the whole process, like meeting with Seth Rogen. I remember I met with him on a Thursday in January of 2012, and then I was back at work at 6 a.m. on Monday trading commodities. Like, <laughs> oh my felt like my life had changed, and I was like back at work. But, um, you know, it, of course it did. It was just a bit of a process. That's so that was actually my next question was like how you got hooked up with with Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg, because they have like this this major Hollywood, like mainstream success. Um, oh, and sure. and yeah. so you just got like your your representation reached out to them and they just liked what you had and, and just said, we yeah. want to we want to sit down with you. And I think that like tells you a lot about Seth and Evan and their company Point Grey that it wasn't because like I was some. Um, impressive hotshot writer that they were like wanting to meet with me. It's because I brought them a story and though I was nobody, they, they appreciated the story and they were interested enough to meet. And of, of course, eventually interested enough to um, help get the documentary off the ground and write the forward to the book and be involved with the adaptation of the of one point of movie now a TV series. Um, so yeah, it wasn't like I had any prior connection to Seth or Evan. Um, they really just were drawn to the material and that's awesome because that means that other people in my position could accomplish something similar, maybe in, in similar you know circumstances. I've, it, it, it's always, I, I, it really was like a life changing moment for me. I also can't express how much I was not expecting to hear back. It was in the same way that like <laughs> when I reached out to people from Sega and Nintendo at first, and I just like expected not to hear back. But if I heard back, it was great. Like I wasn't thinking, oh, I, I wonder what Seth's gonna say. It was more just like, hey, I may as well try. Right. Sure, I'll never hear back. I'm like, <laughs> hey, yeah, have a play to win. Well, exactly. And I, so I, I totally agree with you. It, it speaks to like the kind of people that Seth and Evan are and, and the kind of company they're running. I think it also speaks to uh, the quality of the work for them to, to look at that. And if that's how they make their decisions, to look at your work and say, yes, we want to sit down with you. And then also like yeah. speaks to, to you for like the hustle of, of like, you know what, I'm just going to shoot my shot. I'm going to put it out there. And then before you know it, you're sitting down in a meeting with Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg, who are, I mean, at the yeah. time and, and continue to be these kind of legends of comedy. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. And they met with me and Jonah was there as well. That first meeting and they met with us for two hours. Like that's incredible. They could have just done like a 15 minute, like, Oh, okay, we get it. But they really like, yeah. were so into the stories, into learning about the story. They were so into talking about their gaming experiences and couldn't, couldn't have gone better. Those guys were so awesome. That's, yeah. that's, that's incredible. Um, so uh, obviously like you worked extremely hard on both the book and the movie and, and it really, it really does show in both products. Um, was there anything that surprised you? Like, either in how similar they were or how different like writing the book and making the movie were. Oh, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Um, th like in terms of the process, I guess. I mean, they're, they're both very hard. The, for the, for the book, um, I, I would say like with the book, the hardest thing was figuring out where everything went. Like, like you have to remember that, before I wrote the book, there was not very much on the topic, so it was hard for me to even just know who worked at these companies. Like, I guess I knew of Peter Maine, but to like, how do I even know that Tony Harmon was someone I needed to speak with? And <laughs> right. once I found out his interesting story and his about you know his shedding light on Minoru Arakawa and game development at Nintendo of America, like where did that go in the book? Because I wanted it to always be like a fast moving book. I it, it, you know it's a real time chronological story, but like there's a lot of weaving of history throughout um so structuring the book was really hard and you know it ended up being 550 pages so it was like a, you know there was there was a lot there whereas with the documentary it was sort of the opposite problem that, that it was more the hardest part was how to condense the story to 90 minutes um like i like if someone had asked i definitely could have done like a 10-hour version of that story as oh, i yeah. had basically done with you know the audiobook of console wars is i think like 25 hours so um yeah, just figuring out what what would work in a documentary versus what would work in a book. And then also not even like like there was even less time for 
the characters to tell their story in the documentary because a lot of it too is archival material and that's sort of the whole point of the documentary that's what you're doing you know if people really just wanted the story they could read the book but we wanted to bring it to life in a way that felt like a time capsule of that era so you know we gladly wanted to make room for old commercials and old footage and so just paring things down is 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 was was the hardest part with the documentary okay that's i'm so i've I mean, I, I've never done anything nearly to that scale, um, but like just with with projects that I've worked on and, and like writing samples that I've been asked for that that's a I think I can understand your your difficulty on like a super microscopic scale of like just I write too much and then it just I have to shave it down. And it's like every word is like a child, right, <laughs> that, that you're having right. to kick to the curb. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, I, I will say like it was also very, it it helped. It's always tough to kill your darlings and trim down any content that you create, but it certainly helped me to know that the book was out there. So you yeah. know, like even yeah. the development of Sonic in the documentary, which I think I'm really proud of how we delivered it and how we condensed it. But you know, it's like five minutes long as opposed to like over several chapters, and it doesn't even mention people like Madeline Canepa slash now she goes by Madeline Schroeder. Like there's so many people who aren't talked about, but I did at least feel like, well, if you wanted to, like, if you really those want people to explore are not this. Part of history, they're just not part of the eight characters or so that we selected to tell the story in the documentary form. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so I'm, you know, if you ever decide to do like a director's cut 10 hour, you know, mini series <laughs> on CBS, I'll watch that. I'll, I'll be there for a 10 hour documentary on that. Oh, really? <laughs> That. that was that was what we were talking about before the show, right? Like the length of the book, with uh, with both my books, they're both over five hundred pages, and both of them I hope are very fast reads. Like they're written. The hardest part for me is structuring it so that it reads quickly, um, and 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 like that is always the challenge to get in as much information, but to make it as easy to swallow as possible. So I'm glad that it resonated with you, and that you would say that you would watch the ten hour version because uh, like I, I strongly believe that people like long form content um and are would rather have a book that's 500 pages than you know what publishers often want is like a 300 page book and i feel like if you're spending in some cases like 25 bucks like you should get as much you, know, yeah. you should get your money's worth and i want to deliver that yeah and i mean i you're the book um like i told you before we started uh, the book I, I finished it in four days it it reads yeah. the book reads the way like i don't know if i don't know if you've played gears of war one the, the book reads the way Gears of War 1 plays. I just, <laughs> the first time I played Gears 1, I could not put that game down. And it was like, I finished it in two sittings. And then the second time I went back to it, I finished it in two sittings. And it's just like, I, I don't want to stop playing. And and that's the way I felt about your book as I read it. It was like, God, I just don't want to like, I, I don't want this to, to, to be over. And it's just not long enough. Blake, why couldn't you you have written a you know a fifty hour book? Why why isn't this the length of it? <laughs> um, the other thing that like informed my decision making with that too, and to make it feel like a cliffhanger, or to try to make it feel like a cliffhanger, was again just listening to the people that lived through it. Like they didn't have the benefit of knowing how this ended. They did. They were. They were there every day, hoping to come up with some way to dethrone Nintendo or to stave off of Sega. And I wanted that that drama to, to carry through the book because that's what carried through their lives. Uh, one of my favorite things about telling this story is that even 25, 30 years later, it's still, for, mo- for many of these people, the most or one of the most like greatest times of their life. So it wasn't like I was manufacturing excitement and drama. Like This was such an important period of time in their life and i really wanted to do right by them and to capture that and and having it be like a, a page turner thriller-esque sort of story was important to honoring like their memory of events oh yeah absolutely and and like i mean we all wish that we like had known it was the good old days during the good old days right, right. and i feel like right. the fact that uh toyota Sun still has that hotel room at the comfort inn is just yeah. like he knows that it was the good old days, and he's never going to let yeah. that go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, how much? Like, if I created a character who lived in a hotel room 
<laughs> and a comfort in while working at Sagan in the 90s and still live there 30 years later, I'm pretty positive that my literary agent would say, like, oh, that's kind of ridiculous. Like, no one would believe <laughs> yeah. that. Well, like, truth is strange in fiction, and these guys at Sega and Nintendo, but especially at Sega, are just, like, such endearing, colorful characters that I could not have been more fortunate, you know, to get to tell this, like, that story. Like, like, come on. I can't, I still can't believe that that's real. I, well, and so, like, the the people, I, I would imagine that they were all, you know, because, like you said, this is, it was one of the best times of their lives, I'm sure. And, and like... Right. I'd imagine that they were all very excited to have their story told. Um, so when you first started making the movie, was there, was there anyone in particular that you were like really looking forward to just making that call and being like, Hey, you know, we're making this movie and, and we, we want to bring you in for more interviews. Um, pretty much all of them. Like you said, like, like I, I was, all, these people felt like they had lived through something important but I guess no one had really covered it for 25 years or so. So they maybe like by that point, they were thinking like, Oh, maybe it was just important to me. So to like, I remember even Tom Glinsky who clearly from reading the book, you know, that he has a magic touch or a great sense of what people are going to like. Like he even said to me, he's like, I, you know, I'm happy to talk to you, but I don't think anyone's going to want to read. This. Like who would care? About that? <laughs> so, um, to, to be able to then call Tom less than two years later and say like, Hey, we just got some money to start filming this. Like I want to, let's get this on, on screen. It's pretty awesome for, for all of them. And even the Nintendo people like that's, I I'm, I'm really glad that they have liked it as well. <laughs> Maybe not Peter Main specifically, but like, <laughs> you know, it, it's easy to see this story as like a story between a good guy and a bad guy, uh, you know, that see Nintendo as the villain, but that's not how I really see it. That's how I see it from the perspective of Sega. But in the end, like what Nintendo did was incredible. What like what Sega did was also a lot of what Sony did to Sega. And you see by the end of the film that like Sega is kind of annoyed with the tactics. Like it's yeah. not fun to be in that position of the market leader and sort of getting nipped at and sort of having things twisted to not to not be exactly how they are, but to be portrayed that way. And so, you know, I have a lot of respect for the people in both companies. Yeah. And and like it was. So I, I totally agree with you that like what Nintendo has done is, is just incredible. And like what Nintendo has done for me, like throughout my life is just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I got a super Nintendo for my sixth birthday. I got an N64 for my seventh birthday. Uh, and, and then I did kind of live out the whole like Sony taking over. I got a PlayStation for my eighth birthday, but, um, right. but like, uh, like not, not show, not trying to throw any shade at anyone from Nintendo because I was a Nintendo kid, but the book, man, your book just made me wish I was a Sega kid <laughs> because Sega, they right. were that, they were that scrappy underdog. Um, but well, they also like very intentionally. And I would say like relevant to this moment in time, like they did create a sense of tribalism. Like you were a Sega kid or a Nintendo kid. That didn't exist. Absolutely. Sega. About more than just the business. It was about the marketing and, the way that I think we think about tribalism now, it's pretty negative given our, you know, like, uh, Thing, polarized. Things aren't great right now. <laughs> but you have to remember, or at least I keep in mind, like, part of tribalism is finding an identity. And when I was 13 years old, being a Sega kid was very important to my identity. It gave me a sense of belonging. It helped me feel more confident in myself. It helped me feel like I found my people. I was not going along on social media and saying expletives to the other side. We were arguing <laughs> on the schoolyard. I felt respectful, but like, like the way that we felt on the schoolyard was also very similar to how they felt in the offices at Sega. Like these were people who came from different jobs. You know, Tom obviously had a very stellar reputation, but a lot of the people it was their early, you know, early on in their career, and like this job, like and this group of people was like their identity. So. Um, uh, that that sense of tribalism was important and it was something that Sega, you know, I, like, I, I feel like, like what you just said, like it, it, the book made you wish you were a Sega kid at the time. Like that was more than just buying a hundred dollar console. It was more of like being yeah. part of a like, geisty thing for lack of a better word. Being, I mean, almost like, uh, especially the way it's portrayed in the book, it's almost like it was for Sega kids in the nineties. It was like being part of a rebellion. Right. And, or, yeah. uh, a yep. rebellion against this, this, I'm not going to say they were a monopolist because that's a, that's a dangerous. Well, they were. No, but that's actually fair. Like, I mean, yeah, like that's not really like, 
a subjective opinion. Nintendo uh, dealt with antitrust litigation and yeah. paid these settlements. Like it, they were accused of monopolistic practices, and they paid money. I don't know if they admitted guilt or not, but they paid money because there were I, settlements. <laughs> yeah, um, and like people I spoke to off the record, they were definitely guilty of that behavior. So like. Like and and the, and then what was so cool was that from their perspective they were doing the right thing. They had resurrected the game industry because of substandard product and a, you know glutting the market with poor, with poor content. And so they were putting safeguards in place to prevent that from happening, or at least that was their justification. And I believe that like it was at least fifty fifty that there was like a sincerity to what they were doing. And like a good example that always stuck with me was the Mortal Kombat situation. You know that was when Sega really pulled away from Nintendo and surpassed them for a period of time. And that was because Nintendo, you know, stupidly from the Sega's perspective was Nintendo decided not to include the gore or not, you know, they, they made the blood yeah. green and have the same fatalities. And like, it's easy to like rain, to like make fun of Nintendo, you know, like, oh, like so dumb of you. But they were actually operating from a place of, you know, corporate responsibility. They were thinking we we're trying to do the right thing. So like, I admire that their hearts were in either the right place or at least in a place. They weren't just being arbitrary about it. And that's what I do really respect about Nintendo is that they've stuck to their guns, however, you know, three or four decades later in the gaming industry. And while I don't always like all their decisions, I wish that they were, um, you know, I wish that, they, uh, that Nintendo Switches didn't need to be all jailbroken. I wish that they had <laughs> you know, more of a special library. I can also say that, like like you were saying, like uh, you know, Nintendo has brought so much joy to me in my life. There's no, also never, there's no other company out there of which I've always, I've always received at least my money's worth for the money I spent. Like I bought a lot of crappy Sega games. And that was the whole point. When Tom Clancy wanted you to have the opportunity to buy whatever you wanted. They wanted to give the developers the opportunity to sell what they wanted and let the market decide. But Nintendo had had and still has, you know, very high standards, and some could say like arbitrary at least in the minds of certain developers but at the same time the, their, their customers have always been rewarded for those standards absolutely i mean it's how you get games like it, it, i mean it's how you get games like you know uh ocarina of time majora's mask wind waker and twilight princess in a in an eight-year period or nine-year period <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and there's just with those standards um so the movie yeah. the movie released on streaming um, and, and when did CBS come on board? When, when was, when did CBS come into the picture? They came on board, uh, like I think a year and a half or maybe two years ago. And at that point, uh, Jonah and I had filmed many of the interviews. It was unclear if we we're going to be able to finish the documentary because, um, there was also the dramatized series to think about, which had precedence over that, or at least was a consideration. And so uh, we, w we were hoping to find a partner that would want to do both, both a dramatized series and a, and a documentary. And fortunately, CBS was willing to, which we didn't expect necessarily because they had never done a documentary before for CBS All Access. So we were there first. And so again, in like a, you know, the way I described Seth and Evan is like, it's pretty indicative of their character. They were willing to take the risk. I think it says something about CBS All Access that like they had never done a documentary they could have easily said no we don't do docs but they at least gave us the time of day to pitch what we you know a sizzle reel that we put together and they said like oh let's figure out a way to do this and i like working with people like that that have that mentality of let's figure out how to make this work yeah let's let's grab the bull by the horns and let's like this is obviously something and so let's just let's yeah. make this happen uh that's 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 pretty cool um so uh, so i i gotta this is this is obviously i mean this is a softball question here but like is there is there any like memory or anecdote that you have either from the process of, of writing the book or making the movie that, that just really stands out to you is like, you know, this is a really precious moment for you. Uh, I feel like there's so many, I mean, going to the toy fair the first time and many times with Tom Kalinske, since I live in New York and Tom lives in the Bay area and he would come out every year for toy fair. Cause he is like literally like, the king, like a, you know, the prince of the toy industry or at least he's an inductee to the toy hall of fame. And so just walking around Toy Fair with him and sometimes his daughter, Ashley, who's in the first chapter of the book as a baby or as a young child, uh, and just seeing how everyone in the toy industry all these years later still looks at Tom and talks about Tom and talks to Tom, like that that was a really special moment for sure. That's, I mean, I, he, like, 
he's the king of the toys and, and, and reading, reading the book, you know, it's, I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe him. He's larger than life, right? Reading the book, you, you mentioned Flintstones vitamins and you mentioned He-Man and, and the book starts off with that incredible story about him going to Spain with matchbox cars and, you know, fake matchbox cars. And it's just like all of this stuff. And he's the guy that saved Barbie and all of this stuff. It's like, this was all one person it was just, yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I like part of my job was fact checking that, you know, like, I'm not saying that he was, he does, he's very modest too. So he wasn't saying, Oh, I'm this great guy. But like, you know, uh, some people I spoke to, especially from Nintendo said a monkey could have done Tom's job because they had Sonic and that was really all that mattered. <laughs> and so I don't know, I guess we'll never know. We don't have that experiment, but like, but we do know that like it, it, it would seem unlikely that a monkey could cre- help develop the chewable vitamins and also resurrect Barbie. And like, at some point you have to concede, all right, this guy just is very good at what he does. And, brings that process wherever he goes um yeah yeah i'm i'm i he's he seems like he's went a once in a generation mind um so so before before we wrap up i do want to touch on on what's coming up next for you uh so after console wars um you wrote another book called the history of the future oculus facebook and the revolution that swept virtual reality now that book was released in february of 2019 can we maybe expect another documentary in the next few years? Uh, I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, there's nothing... I can't report anything at the moment, but just to say that similar to with Console Wars, where I felt like the full story hadn't been told and like I wanted to keep telling it in a different form, I still definitely feel that way about Palmer Lucky and Brendan Areeb and the Oculus team and what they were able to do with virtual reality and what they were not able to do and and Facebook's role in it. I think like the Facebook part turned out to probably be the most fascinating part of the book, uh, which I didn't necessarily expect since it was you know more about this American dream rags to riches story of Oculus. But given Facebook's uh, role in so many spheres of life right now and the way that that acquisition panned out, there's a lot to learn. So I guess the short answer is uh, uh, hopefully. I, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading that book. It's next on my list. Um, I, I, in preparing for this, I saw you did an interview with, uh, Tucker Carlson and you told this, like you mentioned this really uh, kind of scary, um, anecdote about, um, kind of a, a situation where, where Mark Zuckerberg had to like write an official statement and, and it just, it, it's, well, he didn't have to. <laughs> didn't he have to where he chose did to an official statement <laughs> and forced an employee named Palmer Lucky, the founder of, of Oculus to post it lying about his political views because it was so unacceptable to be a Trump supporter and an executive at Facebook. And I don't know that. I mean, I guess there's a lot of people who hate Trump more than I do, but I certainly am up there. So I'm not, my approach to this was never as a Trump supporter, but it is as someone who believes you should have like the right to support whichever politician, a two party system, you want. especially also because that is, the law, like in California, you're not, it's illegal to fire someone or treat them differently based on their political views. So that book turned into not at all what I expect it would be, you know, the, it, that it really was like a political thriller by the end, which is not what I signed up for, not what I would have wanted to tell, <laughs> but you know, you follow the story where it goes and it's, it went to a unfortunate place. Like I, I don't, I, I was clearly rooting for Oculus. I wouldn't have written the book if I didn't believe in what they were doing and didn't believe in that team. Um, and it has not gone how they had hoped. So that was kind of a bummer. Yeah. And, and I mean, like not to get political. Um, so I'm, I'm a lifelong liberal and, and I, I do, a, I, I do really draw the line between their, their like liberals and progressives are, are very different um, at this point right. and, and both make up the left wing. Um, I, I'm very much a lifelong liberal, but it, the, I, I am excited to read the book because it's the the authoritarian um, the, as much right. power as these big tech companies hold over over what we consume is is pretty scary right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, just like your small example, like I, you know, I'm a lifelong liberal too. I'm pro choice, and I think that pro choice is the right way to go. But I'm also very conscious of the fact that that's my opinion and not actually right. Like, exactly. That's a, and I know that people on Facebook think that that it's allowed to do certain things if it's pro-choice, but then when the messages are pro-life, you can't do certain things. And their reasoning is basically like, well, but this is the wrong 
I'm not. I'm only making an exception here because it's the wrong view. And it's like, no, that's actually authoritarianism. What you're describing, yeah. Right? <laughs> like, like let's not be that which we despise. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're we're you know we were warned for so long of government censorship that corporate censorship really snuck up on us. Right. Um, so in our correspondence, like getting getting you know this meeting scheduled, you mentioned that you're working on something to do with Larry David. Can you give us just like just a little bit of a sneak peek into what that's going to be? Oh sure. So after I was on Tucker Carlson and Fox News and other political shows, which I felt like they were, it was very nice of them to have me on, but it was not how I envisioned my life going and not what I was looking to do with my writing career. Um, I was wanting to write about someone or something that brought a lot of joy to people, similar to Nintendo and Sega. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't think of anything else that's brought, me, brought more joy to me than Seinfeld and Cover Enthusiasm. So I wanted to write a biography about Larry. And, uh, uh, you know, I've been doing interviews all year with Larry and other people that he's worked with over the years. And uh, there will be another book uh, that I'm writing about Larry David. <laughs> so, uh Again, I keep saying lifelong, lifelong Seinfeld fan. I like, I remember my, I remember my parents making a big deal out of watching the finale when I was like nine. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Right, well, I, need, I need to go in a minute, but I'm just going to put out a theory that Larry has enjoyed the Seinfeld finale, you know, critically panned. And for a long time, especially before Caribbean Enthusiasm, Larry was seen as like, oh, he really botched the finale. Like, is this guy really as talented as we thought? which, by the way, he is and more. <laughs> but, like, I told him that the reason that people didn't like it is because what he created with the finale, with, uh, you know, all the witnesses from over the past eight, nine years of the show coming back and giving testimony that showed how the characters were selfish, I said you basically just created an incredibly elegant narrative clip show. And if, if people remember, before the Seinfeld finale aired, there was a 45-minute Seinfeld clip show. So I think that there was just clip show fatigue. I think that, actually, in a vacuum, the final episode is very good. Oh, yeah. um, it just didn't feel that way. And I didn't like it at the time because I I think that in retrospect, it's because we'd just seen a, a clip show. So I think Larry was screwed by NBC doing a clip show. And uh, I encourage people to take a, another look. Uh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, OK, before I before I let you go, I got to ask, I, I think I know the answer to this. Were you a Sega kid or a Nintendo kid? Oh, I was a I mean, I was a Sega kid, which is probably what you thought. But I was only a Sega kid because my parents who are awesome and usually would try to help me, my, my, me and my brother afford whatever, you know, console we wanted. We wanted a Super Nintendo, but they wouldn't let us get it because it was not backwardly compatible. So <laughs> in retrospect, I think that that's part of what guided me to the console wars, that a business decision is what altered my childhood. Like if Nintendo had spent the, you know, decided that the, the system would cost more and it would be backwardly compatible, my parents would have said, okay, fine. But that's what led me to Team Sega, and I, it was probably a very good thing I was there because of the sports games. <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny how things never change, right? Because we're seeing that same fight with Xbox and PlayStation right now. Um, well, uh, Blake, I, I really do. I want to thank you again. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show, sharing so much about the movie, the book, and, and you know, the process that's gone into them. Um, just a reminder to everyone out there watching or listening, uh, Console Wars is a narrative nonfiction novel available on Audible and uh, also a, a documentary now. It's available exclusively on CBS All Access. I, I really, I cannot recommend either of them enough. Um, and, and that's all we've got for you guys this week. Uh, don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you found us on. And until next time, uh, reset. <laughs>